Welcome back to part two of the eighth bus anniversary. I'm PC Perry, and as Flying Focus Video Collective tends to do, we're looking at the voicing of the voiceless. This time it's looking at AT&T TCI, the merger, and why Portland decided to take on this conglomerate and insist that the voice should be with the voiceless, not a top-down directive from AT&T, even though it ate up TCI, that it should be the director of communications for Portland and the entire country. We looked at cable access, independent uh, internet producers, access uh, producers, and uh, citizens' utility boards what their perspectives were on the uh, merger and who would lose or who would gain. The aim is to get the control of content and uh, production back in the hands of people who actually did pay for the airwaves and that is the issue that is being looked at in the uh, piece coming up. In uh, 1998 AT&T purchased TCI the city of Portland has a franchise with TCI, or had. In other words, TCI had a contract with the city to use city rights of way to run its cable plant across our streets and into our homes. Um, when AT&T bid to purchase and purchase TCI, at that point then, our contract with TCI was really in flux, and we have the authority to approve any transfer of that contract from one entity to another. So therefore, our contract was effectively opened. And the city of Portland and the county had to consider whether or not we would pro approve the, the transfer of that franchise from our original contract with TCI to AT&T. The big issue that's become involved in this, in this merger is uh, internet access through the cable lines. Okay. Uh, uh, the cable system's changing, so rather than just being a one-way provider of television, it's a two-way provider of uh, access to the internet. And the, the cable is really the superior technology. It's, it's the fastest access you can have to the internet. Uh, for folks who have sort of traditional modems, if you ever get to a cable modem, uh, it's like night and day. Uh, it's instant access, it's quick, quick. Uh, you're seeing things in real time, you're seeing moving pictures, uh, it's, it's, it's much different. It's like comparing the newspaper to the television news. Uh, and in such, because it's such superior technology, uh, AT&T has said they want to monopoly control that. The only way you're going to get access to the internet uh, under AT&T's cable is to do it through their internet uh, service provider. What AT&T has previously said is that it would like access to company facilities of US West or GTE mm -hmm. or whomever you use as a phone company. However, the company has interestingly experienced a flip-flop in position with the purchase of the cable modem facility or, the, or TCI, the cable uh, company. Hi, I'm Barb Green. This next um, clip is from a trip that I took with Dan Handelman to farm sanctuary, um, a sanctuary for farm animals in upstate New York last year. A lot of people think that, that dairy cows, um, that's what they do is give milk, but actually cows only give milk when they're impregnated, just like female women or any other mammal. And um, so what happens to dairy cows is that they're given lots of hormones to produce a lot of milk, and they're also impregnated constantly. And um, that usually lasts for about four years before their uh, milk production slows down. Their bodies just can't take it anymore. And then they're actually sent to slaughter also. And their babies, when their babies are born, are usually either used to replace the dairy cows, um, the dairy herd, or they're used for the veal industry um, to be used for veal. So a lot of people don't realize that they're, like, the dairy industry and the veal industry are linked right together like right. that. Yeah, unfortunately. A lot of people say, well, what are you going to do, not milk them? Right. Then it makes it uncomfortable for them if you don't milk them. No, basically their milk will dry that's, up. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a and and if, they were, if they need to be milked, it's usually because they've just had a, a, a baby cow, right. you know, or a calf. So th that milk should be for the calf, you know. Right. So that means that their calf has been taken away and shipped to either the veal industry or used to replace the dairy herd. So it's not a natural. Mm -hmm. 
So you might be wondering why um, that woman from the farm sanctuary was saying that uh, milk is unnatural for people when everybody in the world drinks milk, right? Well, listen to this from um, an article written by Robert Cohen, the author of a book called Milk, the Deadly Poison, and he's also the executive director of the Dairy Education Board. Um, he got a copy of one of the Watergate tapes. On March 23, 1971, dairy industry representatives visited President Richard Nixon in the White House. They came bearing a cash gift of $3 million. Aware that the tape was rolling, Nixon said, uh, I know that uh, you are a group that are politically very conscious, and you're willing to do something about it. And I must say, a lot of businessmen and others don't do anything about it. And you do, and I appreciate that. And I don't have to spell it out. After the dairymen left, John Connolly was alone with Nixon and said, they are tough political operatives. This is a cold political deal. Later, Connolly remarked, these dairymen are organized. They're adamant. They're militant. And they're amassing an enormous amount of money that they're going to put into political activities, very frankly. I think that's why um, everyone in the United States thinks that milk is great for us, because it's an industry that has a lot of money. Another industry that uses animals and has a lot of, in, of money is the um, greyhound racing. And this next clip shows uh, some of the realities about greyhound racing. Last week, as I was reviewing the countless documents and papers uh, regarding the atrocities of this industry, I thought of a uh, ad advertising slogan I had read back in California earlier this year. And um, it had to do with another form of entertainment, the circus. But nonetheless, I think it's sort of a universal statement when it comes to animals and entertainment. And the ad had to, had to do with uh, circus elephants. And there was a d dead elephant. And the slogan read, the circus is coming to town, and the animals are dying to entertain you. Yeah. And that really hit home for me. And if you think about the 20 to 25,000 greyhounds a year that are dying to entertain us and from what I've read that doesn't even include maybe another 20 to 25,000 that are unaccounted for each year. This next clip is from a show um, done by Yvonne Simmons. Yvonne, again, is still over in Yugoslavia. And um, this show is one from footage that she accumulated of animals and showing how they're affected by war. War kills animals, too. And often I would be asked, well, why, why help the cats and dogs? But if you help the cats and dogs, you also help the people. At this moment in time, a group has been registered with the government in Sarajevo of 70 Bosnians who are so upset about what has happened to their pets. They've been strangled to death with wire, bludgeoned to death, shot in front of the children and said that they were going to be used as soap when the children would have these little puppies as their pets. This dog was run over by a car and was kind of limping around 
and the children started kicking it until it got to the stage where it couldn't walk around anymore. Unfortunately, the children have learnt so much violence, having spent so many years of their young lives around violence. But neighbours covered the dog up and fed it every day. And then after five days of it living like this, they finally found me because they were looking for me. We called him Stretchko, which means lucky. And here he is now. He still has a limp, but he has a very good home. This is the third home that we got him to. An elderly man took him first, then couldn't keep him. But this young boy, who's 12, loves dogs. And this is Stretchko's home, which is outside Sarajevo in a place called Butmir. This boy's sister was killed during the war. And that's his mother with silver. You can see what a happy dog Stretchko is. And it's so, so wonderful to see this because it's not so often that you get um, there's been a lot of uh, success stories. This next clip is from a lecture by Lillian Fatterman at Portland State University. She's a historian who wrote a book called What Lesbians Have Done for America. Um, this is one of the few shows that I've worked on that actually has some good news in it. It shows all of the positive things that um, lesbians have done for Americans and especially for women. I think, though, that, that lesbians were effective leaders for social of social movements for other reasons also. I think they, they were really fighting for their lives, or at least they were fighting for the equality of their lives. If no man was going to represent them at the polls or in politics, of course they needed the vote. They needed the power to effect social change. If no man was going to support them, they needed higher education and they needed good jobs. And because their partner was another woman, I think they, they really <laughs> felt the plight of women of their era doubly. And that enhanced their desire to stand shoulder to shoulder with other women to improve women's conditions. So what did these early lesbians accomplish? My book is divided into four sections how American women got the vote, how American women got educated, how American women got into the professions, and how America got a social conscience. And in all those cases, of course, I show how it was really women who we today would call lesbians who were the driving force in, in uh, all of those movements. Perhaps the best known woman in my book, and maybe the, uh, the single best known woman in all of American history, is Susan B. Anthony. The, uh, the second best known woman is also in my book, and that's Eleanor Roosevelt. But um, Anthony was the driving force of the women's suffrage movement for almost 50 years. She really earned the posthumous honor of having the 19th Amendment named after her. It's called, of course, the, the Anthony Amendment. Her detractors called her a grim old gal with a manly air. <laughs> but women in the movement absolutely loved her. And as I've discovered through correspondence, she loved several of them back. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Kyle Yamada, and I produced a show with Dan called Atomic Legacy about the 1999 Hiroshima Day uh, memorial ceremony. Uh, what struck me most about this event was that it uh, didn't just focus on the two bombs that the US dropped in Japan half a century ago. It uh, looked at the effects of nuclear weapons on the home front and on warfare today. We are spending one half of our discretionary budget on weapons of mass destruction and on the military. One half. And why are we doing it? because it's great business if you can be in it. November 20th, 1989, my mom and I were diagnosed that day by the same doctor as having cancer. That happens when you are toxically exposed to the same, at the same time. I had surgery December 1st, mom died December 27th, 1989. Plutonium is a bone and liver seeker. Hanford is missing one and a half tons of plutonium 
but it claims it's only in the paperwork. Five weeks after mom's death, our son called me and he told me, Mom, I'm watching a documentary about Hanford. They're talking about you, Mom. They're talking about our family. Scientists are doing a study. You have to get involved. And I believe that the U.S. knows that nobody wants to see a nuclear weapon never used again. Instead, they found a way to use slow motion, create slow motion Hiroshima. I was in the Congress six years. If four people in those six years came to me and said, Congresswoman, we've got to cut military spending, that was a lot of people. And during the so-called Gulf War of 1991, the U.S. had the opportunity to use, for the first time in a major conflict, depleted uranium, which is a, a nuclear materials that are no longer usable in bombs or in nuclear reactors. Depleted uranium is a very strong metal, which can pierce tanks, and is also radioactive. When a DU shell hits a solid object, it catches fire and splits into burning particles, spreading all over the atmosphere, into the ground and eventually leaking into the groundwater. Incidents of cancer and leukemia in Iraq have gone up by startling rates since the U.S. attack in 1991. There is nobody who's going to take you to task for putting more money into the United States military. And unless we stop that, we will continue to produce weapons of mass destruction. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm back again. And I'm with Kyle editing that program about Hiroshima Day. And I was also able to put together a program from the 1998 Hiroshima Day event, thanks to our intrepid, sometimes contributing producer and producer of cable programs in his own right, Mr. Jim Lockhart. So thanks for helping me out with that. Well, that worked out great, Dan, because you were able to supply the angle from your camera for what I did out at MCTV, and then I supplied what I did to you, and you, you did a show through here. Yeah, so... So I, did, I ended up doing the whole, the whole show, and you ended up doing excerpts from it, I uh -huh. believe. Right, so what we're going to show tonight is probably a clip from... Senator Mark Hatfield, who went, actually went into Hiroshima only days after the atomic bomb blast killed about 100,000 people there, and that changed his views on war forever. The bomb was dropped on this date 53 years ago and negated our activity and turned our attention to gathering up the occupation forces, the American troops in the Philippines, to transfer them uh, to Japan. While we were on our second trip into Kyuri, Japan, we were given a day to a few of the officers and men, enlisted men, were asked to take a trip into Hiroshima, which was about 30 miles from us, in small landing craft, about 25 foot long. We were to make observations of the remaining problems in Hiroshima and make that as a report. Let me say that one of the great scars of war is when it teaches our people to hate. And I had to tell you, I have to tell you, that when you are facing an enemy and it's the idea is you get him before he gets you, there is an element of hate that comes into your mind, into your heart. When we were entering that city, I could still sense a hate. But then as we landed and the small children, curious as children are the world over, began to gather around us, we realized that they were hungry. And so we took our, without any signal, without anyone saying what we were going to do, we automatically sort of reached for our sack lunches and broke up our sandwiches and handed them to the children. And I have to say, that was more than feeding hungry children. It was truly a sense, a spiritual sense of relief that my hate left me. Jim and I also worked together on a 90-minute program featuring Jim Hightower, the acerbic radio commentator and one-time Texas Secretary of Agriculture. He came to Portland last September, 1998. And uh, what well, we had three cameras set up for that. Well, three cameras set up, so we had a lot more work in post production where we had to, to uh, work the three different tapes into one tape at the end rather than the usual two. So it, it was challenging. But it was fun because we had the Angels, the Next Generation, and they were singing funny songs. So that, mm -hmm. was, that was a good show. Jim and Kelly, who was our third camera person on that Jim Hightower show, also helped me by videotaping at a demonstration against the U.S. bombing of Yugoslavia back in April of 99. 
using their footage and a tape of media critic Norman Solomon provided by Stony Burke from Berkeley, California, and footage of a teach-in at Reed College, I tried to analyze and deconstruct the spin being put on the war by the mainstream media. It's often said from all different quarters that we live in Orwellian times, mm -hmm. but to watch TV and look at what's happening with coverage brings it home, or can bring it home. When you watch the briefings on the cable channels and see the Pentagon showing their video games, which are meant to replicate the dropping of 2,000 pound bombs on populated areas. When we tune in and hear the incessant use of terms like degrade and collateral damage and air campaign, we can see the unfolding of a process that is premeditated, that is well planned, that is seen as useful to eliminate opposition to this war machine. When um, correspondents from major media conglomerates go abroad and have to report on very short turnaround times what is happening abroad, they tend to tell us very different stories. They don't tell us the facts and they don't tell us the figures, not because there's a conspiracy, but because they're, they're living under constraints imposed by their profession and imposed by the fact that they work in a very competitive industry dominated by a very small number of media conglomerates. Those guys that are Vietnam vets who fought in, in Vietnam, uh, we really know what the bombings do. And the bombings are terrible. It's a terrible thing. So uh, I can still remember 1968 going into villages that were uh, bombed not only with uh, B-52s, but also napalm and cluster bombs. It's a devastating thing. One of our producers, Jason Long, has gone AWOL to another city, so we ended up editing a lot of footage that he left behind. I was anxious to put together a program featuring Jose Ramos Horta, the Nobel Prize winning independence activist from East Timor. He visited Portland in April, and I knew that when the elections in East Timor were coming up in August, I wanted people to be aware of Horta's positions on the government of Indonesia and the role Americans could play in helping the independence movement there. I had no idea the amount of violence that would later erupt and make this show much more timely than I expected. Uh, ben Lawson actually helped me a little bit editing this. This is his first time uh, helping out with Flying Focus. We're hoping that he'll be producing some shows in the future. And I really want to apologize for the audio quality on this clip. This is the best we could do with the footage we had. But there are conservative forces that all along the last few months have attempted to derail the democratic reforms by provoking religious and ethnic conflict. There has been in a lot of killings in Ambon, in Aceh, in West Papua, in Kalimantan. A lot of this has been provoked by certain elements, forces within the army. In East Timor, from the very beginning, when the Indonesian president, probably inspired by some pragmatic considerations, because the issue of East Timor has become too costly for the country, both in terms of resources they waste on the war, of soldiers they lose in combat. Some estimate put Indonesian soldiers killed in a steamer in combat at more than 20,000. Hi, I'm Cindy Chan. I worked with Crispin Rosencrantz on the video Cindy's Spice World. We kind of made it on a whim, but uh, it ended up actually getting shown in a few places at some festivals around town and made it onto the Flying Focus video bus in early 1999. Um, the making of this video began with Crispin's and my travels to a Spice Girls look-alike contest at um, the Clackamas Town Center Mall one rainy winter day in Portland. And it just kind of grew from there. It was about the time that the Spice World movie was going to come out and Crispin had a hunch that if he contacted their publicity people he might be able to get some promo video material. Sure enough, it paid off and um, you know, we had a lot of fun watching the promo stuff 
and we just you know kept getting ideas all the time about you know more and more stuff that we wanted to to explore with the idea of the Spice Girls and, and our own lives. January 17th 1998 and I have to say that before I went to this contest I knew nothing zilch zero about the Spice Girls about any of it. <laughs> We went home and watched some Spice Girl videos, and I gotta tell you, before I had seen these Spice Girl videos, I had never seen any actual Spice Girls footage. Hi, we're the Spice Girls, and welcome to a Spice Adventure! They're really good at speaking in unison. Yeah. God, this is so goofy. After harshing on them so much, it was only fair for me to walk a mile in those platform shoes. Emotions at me. So after spending some hours studying their moves, trying them out, getting in front of the camera and the bright lights, I had a new appreciation for how much work it is to do what they do. If what you see here startles or scares you, then maybe you need to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on with mainstream trends and, and teen culture. But if, on the other hand, what you see here is something you're totally blasé to and it doesn't uh, startle you at all, then maybe you need to think a little bit more critically about the kind of stuff that people swallow every day and the kinds of things that, that people take in as subliminal messages. Thanks for watching part two of the eighth bus anniversary on the Flying Focus video bus. If you want more information or to get involved, you can contact Flying Focus using the phone number or the email address that's appearing on your screen. Thanks a lot.